I was a mom and married and I had two children and it was 1987. My youngest daughter had just been born and she was uh, just a, a month old when I injured my back um, lifting something too heavy. So about four months passed uh, with the doctors uh, examining me and the first doctor that I saw said that I wouldn't walk again and I went to a neurosurgeon after that and he looked at all the tests that had been done on me and he said that he could fix the problem. I checked into the hospital the day before the surgery and it was December 1987 when this occurred. They were going to conduct a myelogram which is a test where they inject iodine dye into the back of your neck, in my case, and they have you laying on an x-ray table, and they then tip the x-ray table so that the dye will flow down your spinal cord to determine whether the spinal cord was damaged when the disc blew out of the, um, the lower back area. So they proceeded to start with the testing, and they asked me to hold really still because they said once they inject the dye into my neck, if I moved at all, that I would suffer from really bad headaches for quite a few months afterwards. So I was laying very still on the table and the neurosurgeon and the orthopedic surgeon that were going to be doing the surgery the next morning were in the room when this test was going to be done. It was lucky that they were there because the person who had his finger on the x-ray table was pushing the wrong button. The x-ray table tipped the wrong way, um, which caused my head to be lowered below my feet. And that caused the dye that they'd in just injected into the back of my neck to flow into my brain area. And it very quickly caused me to uh, lose consciousness and uh, when I lost consciousness, I went up on the ceiling. As I looked down at my body and saw the top of the heads of everybody in the room, I wasn't startled or upset or frantic or panicked. It was a very calm, it was a very wrapped in love feeling up there, like you were in the warm blanket and everything was fine and I looked down at my body on the x-ray table and I could hear the x-ray technician next to me calling code blue I actually didn't know what code blue meant but I said huh if I'm up here on the ceiling and my body's down there and he's calling you know frantically code blue I think I just died so there wasn't any alarm or worry or panic. It felt very comfortable. In the next second when I saw that everything was going into very high speed uh, resuscitation efforts down below, it seemed really obnoxious actually with everybody kind of yelling at each other and moving very quickly. And there was a presence next to me on the ceiling and that presence felt huge, loving, and accepting of me. And the feeling that I felt with that presence felt as though I had been part of that presence and it had been part of me for eternity. It was unbelievable to feel that uh, love and that acceptance and that degree of intensity that I had in those moments with this presence next to me. And I began talking to the presence and saying, I really want to go back. I want to go back for my five-month-old daughter, and I want to go back for my eight-year-old son. If I leave them, if I leave their lives in this way, if I leave them at this time, then they will not grow up to be the human beings that they could be if I was contributing to them. And I really want to go back to be with them. Please, could I please re-enter this life? On top of that, I also knew up there on the ceiling what my plan was for my life, what my purpose was. And I 
said to the being, I haven't completed my, my purpose and I really want to go back into my life to be able to do that, to do what I had planned to do. Down below, they were bringing in an oxygen cart and they put an oxygen mask on my face and this woman did that and then there was a woman that was calling at a desk that was in the corner of the room there was a phone over there and she was calling for the defib unit to be brought in defibrillation to restart my heart in the midst of of watching everything unfolding in the cpr and the resuscitation there was this man that came in and he had a small box that he placed on a shelf next to the x-ray table as I was talking to this being, I was watching this man and I didn't actually know what he was doing. I moved from instantaneously from the ceiling to right in front of the box and he flicked a little lever on the side of the box and it turned on a green light inside the box and it made the box start making a monotone sound. And the little green light traveled across the screen in a straight line. All of a sudden I realized oh oh this is supposed to be going like this and it was not registering that I had any heart rate and when I realized it was a heart monitor then I was instantaneously moved back up on the ceiling again and then had the view down um, of my body on the x-ray table and above everyone uh, looking down at their heads and and the whole spread out of the room so um, that was very interesting. So I saw my own flat line and um, what the doctor did, the orthopedic surgeon, he stepped forward two steps. He said, stand clear to the people who were doing the CPR and were around the head of the table. And they backed off and he just took his fist and he arched it from over his head and from behind his back and he just pounded the center of my chest. I watched that from up above and I watched my body react to that blow, but of course it did not restart my heart. And he then arched his arm back again and struck my chest the second time. And when he struck my chest, my eyes simply shut from up above and I blinked open my eyes and I was looking straight into his face. He stepped backwards and the people around the table were um, stepping back in to stabilize me and I started talking into the oxygen mask. I was very alarmed because I, I couldn't explain what had just happened to me and I was asking that question, what just happened, what just happened? The nurse leaned over me and she said, please don't talk, we need to stabilize you. So I had to wait for about 20 minutes until they took the oxygen mask off and I then started blurting out what 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 just happened I was up on the ceiling I could see everything I could see what we were doing and the neurosurgeon he ended up saying oh brother really sarcastically and that caused me to want to be believed so I said no I actually was on the ceiling and I could see everything and she's the person who brought in the oxygen card and connected it up to my face and that man brought in the heart monitor and I actually watched it flatlining. Then you said this to him and he said that to you and I explained the conversation that the two doctors had been having just before they did the precordial thump. You said stand clear. You stepped two steps forward and you struck me in my chest but it didn't work the first time and the second time that you struck me then I came back. I was up on the ceiling. And the neurosurgeon had, by this time, since it had taken me so long to kind of tell all that, had turned white and he just looked with this like, look of shock. And then he just said, I'm not going to stand here and listen to this. And he stormed out of the room. But the rest of the people, all the support staff and the orthopedic surgeon, they stayed in the room. And the orthopedic surgeon continued to talk to me and say, you know, what did you feel and how did you feel? And he asked me questions and I answered them and everybody listened. And, and then after they stabilized me further, they put me on a gurney and they sent me up to a private room. And from that point on, I had the surgery the next morning and every single person that I interacted with that came into my room to check my vitals, 
the doctors, everyone. I asked them what happened during that myelogram. What, what was that that happened? I got a lot of different variables on what they said, but most everybody wouldn't talk about it. I mean, everybody didn't talk about it, but they said, I don't know what you're talking about, or I don't see anything on the records about this. And it really closed me down as to what had happened. And so when they did the surgery the next day, my husband came to visit after the surgery with my children, and I told him what happened the night before, and he shut me down the rest of the way by saying, oh, that couldn't have happened. You probably hallucinated it. So when he said that to me, my feeling was I didn't want anybody in the world to think I was hallucinating. That to me was a real negative, and I just decided not to tell anybody else. So I was released from the hospital about three days after the surgery, and I never actually spoke about that near-death experience, didn't even know it was called a near-death experience at the time, had never heard of Raymond Moody, who wrote the book Life After Life in 1975. I had no idea that anyone else had ever had one of these. And so my life continued on, and one of the things that changed, though, was the fact that while I was up on the ceiling and I was telling that being that I wanted to go back, the very last thing was that the being spoke to me. And the being said, if you go back, you will still be in your marriage. What will you do about that? I had someone who was abusive and who was very controlling, was really making my children's lives and, and my life very difficult. And I had been trying to give the benefit of the doubt in a lot of situations and trying to believe that he would make changes to his life if I just continued to contribute towards changing the way that he looked at things. But it wasn't working and I knew that. And so in that moment when I was asked that, it kind of stopped me dead in my tracks basically. And so what I said to the being was, if you allow me to go back, then I promise that I will become brave enough, strong enough to leave him. And right when I said that, that's when the doctor struck my chest that second time. It took me three years to move in that direction very slowly towards leaving my husband. And I did do that when my daughter was three years old. It was a very difficult time for me, and I had been very scared to do that, but that near-death experience and what happened at the end of that discussion with me talking one-sidedly to that being and then them finally saying to me, what are you going to do with your life? That was really powerful for me, and it, it, it gave me, I think, the strength to move out of a very traumatic uh, marriage that I would have would have floundered in and was floundering in and it was a very difficult time for me. So that started a whole new um, chapter in my life of a very happy chapter of my life that um, was, was a really great replacement for what I had been living through. And about 12 or so years later after the NDE when my daughter was about 12, I was at a gymnastics practice for her at the university where I worked at and a friend of mine was sitting next to me and she was explaining to me that her mom was dying and I was feeling sad for her because she was very impacted by the fact that her mom's last weeks were happening right at that time. And something inside me, I hadn't talked about my near-death experience for, all these years after my husband said it was a hallucination, I never spoke to anybody about it. I never researched it. I never tried to find out what it was. I didn't know the term near-death experience. And this woman just kind of brought it out of me. And I decided that I needed to tell her about it because I thought that it would help her in how she was looking at her mom's impending death. She was a nurse at the local hospital. And so I recounted what had happened to me during my near-death experience. And she was 
in awe and she said, Barbara, I, I know you're telling me the truth. And I said, how could you know that? I haven't ever told anybody this story and how could you know that I'm telling you the truth? And she said, because what you're telling me is, is how they would resuscitate you. And I know that because that's the area that I work in at the hospital. So what you're telling me that they did with the fist on the chest is called a precordial thump. That's where I learned this, the term from. And she told me all about it, how the doctors weren't able to do that unless they'd seen me die. So she's the one who validated it for me. And probably within the next few years after that, I started looking online because by then the internet had come into existence for the common man and I had access. And so I started investigating and I found out it was called a near-death experience and and I found out you know details about near-death experiences I ended up deciding to write up my near-death experience and I decided to submit it to a website called the near-death experience research foundation which is run by Dr. Jeffrey Long what ended up happening was that Jeffrey Long invited me to go to a conference that was going to be happening in San Diego, California in 2009. I thought, oh gosh, I'm going to be able to meet people who research near-death experiences and also other experiencers. I'll be able to actually talk to other people who've had this happen. I really want to go. And the very first night that I was there, I was a little bit scared because these were all people I felt that were researchers and they knew a lot about the subject and I still felt like a newbie. So when I met Dr. Long and I ended up chatting with him, there was a group of people that gathered around him and they were obviously researchers and people within the IANS organization. It was the International Association for Near-Death Studies. That was the name of the conference. And so as I stood there and listened um, to his conversations, they were talking about what the conference subject was that year, which was after effects that near-death experiencers have. And there are common after effects that they had been researching, and they were talking about them. So as I listened, I was just really disconcerted because I felt that the after effects that they were naming were not after effects that happened after my near-death experience. I was alarmed because it was like they were naming things that were resonating for me all the way back to my earliest childhood memories. So after they finished talking in kind of a group conversation, people turned to each other and were just kind of conversing and this woman was standing next to me. I turned to her and I said, I, I just don't understand if the after effects are what you're saying they are, why would I have them all the way back to my early childhood, not just after I had my near-death experience? I didn't know her name and it was PMH Atwater. And she's written about 16 books about near-death experiences. And she took my hands and she was so calm and comforting and she said, my dear, I think that you should talk with your family because if you've had the after effects that we were just talking about all the way back to your early childhood, there's a great likelihood that you had another experience when you were young. Well, at the time, I have to admit that I thought, oh wow, that's wacky. There's no way that I had a near-death experience when I was young. Wouldn't my parents or my siblings, my older siblings at least, have told me about that? I thought, my parents are dead and I can't ask my mom what that might be about. So I went, I was going up to Oregon to visit my older brother about a month after the conference. I had never told any of my family about my near-death experience. I said, hey, um, so I'm doing a background medical history on myself all the way back to my birth. And I remember when I did, you know, X, Y, and Z, hurting my arm, hurting my leg, breaking my ankle, you know, whatever my early childhood memories were of medical issues. And I said to him, kind of this open-ended question, do you remember anything else that I need to put on my medical record? We had dinner, we were having a great time with our, my husband and my family and his family. 
And at the very end of the dinner, he came to me and he kind of came really close and he said, Barb, there's something I need to apologize to you for. I should have told you something years ago. And every time I ever thought about telling you, I just it wasn't the right time. When you were 18 months old, you died. I just couldn't believe that he said that. And my husband was just astonished too. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, when you were 18 months old, you got a very high fever and you were really sick. He said, I don't remember what you had. He said, I was 12. My mom was pregnant with our youngest child, um, their youngest child, which is my little sister. He said, what happened was that I was very ill with the fever and I went into convulsions and I stopped breathing. The fire department told my father to tell my mom to put me into a tepid bath, so draw the water with just um, not hot or cold, and um, submerse me up to my neck in that water, and then to slowly add ice cubes to the water to slowly lower my body temperature. They were sending the ambulance over, but they wanted her to do this first before the ambulance got there. So my mom was in the bathroom, and unfortunately in 1958, we just had one tray of ice cubes. So that was brought from the freezer, but my mom then sent my two brothers, the 10 and the 12-year-old, off to the neighbor's houses to gather ice from the neighbors in, you know, emergency, run, run, go get this ice. When he came back, he stood in the doorway, handed my mom the ice, and stood in the doorway of the bathroom, and he said, he looked at me and my mom was sobbing over me and he said, you were soft purple. All of a sudden, my mom had been adding the ice to the water and all of a sudden, he said, I came alive again by arching my back and taking in a deep breath. And then he said, I turned bright red immediately when I did that. And he said, I started crying and the ambulance tech people came into the bathroom. They stabilized me, wrapped me up, and then took me off into the ambulance. So my mom and dad are calling for the nanny to come upstairs, and my sister came running up the stairs and said, why did Barbie have a temper tantrum? And my mom was leaving out the door with my father, had grabbed her purse and was gonna follow the ambulance to the hospital, and she stopped and said, why would you say that Barbie was having a temper tantrum? And my mom was upset by what my sister said. And she said, well, that's what Mrs. Oates said to me, that Barbie was upstairs having a temper tantrum. So my parents rushed off to the hospital and I came home, my brother thinks, four or five days later. So I have both my brother's and my sister's memories of the incident and so I I, and all of the after effects were very apparent through my early childhood and were rather upsetting to my mom at times because one of the major after effects is intuition. And what would happen would be things like my mom holding my hand and I'm five years old and we're standing on a street corner and I'm in downtown Salem, Oregon where I was raised and all of a sudden I'm hiding my face and my mom says, what are you doing? Why are you acting like that? I said to her, there's going to be two cars that are going to crash together. And right after I said that to her, two cars crashed in the intersection right in front of us. And my mom, alarmed and upset by just me having said that just before it happened, kind of grabbed me and said, don't tell anyone that you can do that. Don't tell anyone that you're able to do that. And I heard that a lot from my mom, actually, because there were a lot of variety of things that I would do that were upsetting to her. And it, I don't think she understood it. And I don't think there was much information about those types of activities. And I think she thought it was negative. And she told me not, you know, not to do it and not to talk about it. So the many incidents that occurred happened even up through junior high age and my high school age. There were incidents where my friends would actually 
questioned me as to how I could have possibly known that something was going to happen, it alarmed them. And in fact, in high school, I had um, three or four friends that I had an incident occur right in front of them where I told them what was going to happen and it happened. And they felt that it was something like I was a witch or something and they were really upset by it. And I didn't know how to explain it either. And I just really got upset with them and said they couldn't call me a witch. That wasn't acceptable and I wouldn't, I wouldn't allow that. So many years and many intuition moments have passed and I recognize now that it's a benefit that I have the intuition and I actually welcome it and enjoy it and I use it really well. But I, I, I'm not a medium. I don't have people pay me for it or anything like that. I just, it's just beneficial for my life when I get messages that happen that save my life sometimes and other incidents that occur where it helps me um, with what I'm doing. When my grandfather died, it was my father's father. Uh, my mom received the telephone call and I came running from my room hearing my mom sobs. She said that my grandfather had died. So the reaction that my older sister and my younger sister had was to burst into tears. And I was about nine years old and I remember thinking this happy, absolute effervescence came into my soul at that moment. I thought, oh boy, he gets to go home. And my mom said, why aren't you crying? Didn't you love grandpa? And I realized in that moment that I had behaved in a different way than my siblings. And I then said, yes, I love grandpa. And I started crying. I forced myself to cry. But that wasn't my natural reaction to it. And that made me feel weird at the time because I didn't understand that at all. In high school, I had a very good friend who was very ill with kidney issues, and he ended up dying at age 21. And we had a lot of conversations about death. I talked with him a lot about that because he knew he was there was a limit to his life because his kidneys were dying. And we had a lot of conversations about that. And I think I was the only person that he felt comfortable with talking about that. And even as a high school person, and in my early college years, there was a difference in what I understood and what I could draw from, even though no one had contributed to that. I, I didn't go to church. Um, I didn't have parents that um, talked about that type of stuff. There was nothing being inserted into my life. So when I realized that I had the near-death experience at age 31, I still didn't know about the near-death experience I had when I was young, but it really changed my viewpoint on death. And it really allowed me to see that if I continued past the point of my body's death, if I was up on the ceiling, if I who I was, all of me, who I, who I am, all of my thoughts and, and feelings were up on the ceiling, then when I looked down at my body, it was no different than looking at a, a wetsuit I had just shed. Who I was was up on the ceiling. So when other people died in my life as people passed, I realized that they continued beyond the point of death and it really lessened my grief. Yes, I would miss them. I would miss their time in my life and my interactions with them. But I also felt as though, even though they were gone, that I still had a relationship with them. Not that I could hear them or see them or anything like that, but that I felt that their consciousness still existed and that if I sent them love and told them I still thought of them and that I saw a particular thing that reminded me of them, that they would, they would know that and they would know that I was sending my love across the veil to them. So it's been a very different 
life, understanding that from pretty much in my early 30s and beyond that, I actually believe that I had pieces of that understanding all through my early childhood because that's why I reacted the way that I did when my grandfather died. So for me, it's a huge gift. It is an amazing gift to know that death doesn't hold anything over me, that when people pass away, that they still continue to exist, their consciousness survives death, and that I will again see them uh, when, I, when I end this life, whenever this particular life goes and, and ends, that I'll then be in that level with them, the other side is what I call it, and I'll see them again, and they're part of the greater consciousness, and I, I don't know the whole idea of everything behind all of that. I'm still learning as I go along what I want to believe and what I feel resonates with me, but I, I do know that I, I don't feel that death has any hold on any of us. I, I believe we just shed those bodies. It changes the way you look at people too. It changes the way that you accept people and it changes the way that you view the world because if you view each person instead of their body being who they are, if you view them as their soul instead, then you overlook height differences, weight differences, color, um, religion, uh, anything. It, it totally changes that the outlook of of each person is just another soul. And when you look beyond the exterior and you look for who they are, it, it's just, it's way more beautiful to find who they are inside rather than just seeing the outside of the person and judging on that. So that's been a lifelong thing that I've been practicing and working at to get better at and it's really improved my life amazingly to, to have that viewpoint. The first time that I went to a medium was because a friend of mine at the university had a person that she knew that was, that she had gone to that she felt was just a pretty amazing person. So this friend of mine said, you should really try this, you should really go. And I had never had anybody that I knew that had gone to one, and I'd never gone. So my friend encouraged me, and I decided to go ahead and go. And the minute that she saw me, I didn't know her at all. I'd never met her. She proceeded to give me a reading. And one of the things she said was, you're going to have your own business. You're going to create your own business. I see it being very successful. And at the time I was working at the university and I thought, I'll never leave the university. Are you kidding? This is the best job I've ever had. I love it. And my husband works there and we're so much a part of the university. There's no way that I would leave. So some years passed, probably about six. I was in my living room one morning and I ended up hearing a voice and feeling a grip on the top of my head. And I heard this voice that said, you will have a scrapbook store. And it was this big, deep voice. And I was totally alarmed, and I, I didn't know what to think. And I was alone in the living room. It was early in the morning. I'd just woken my son up. And I looked up at the ceiling, and I said, I don't know what you're talking to me for about a scrapbook store, because I don't scrapbook, and I don't know what you're talking about, and I don't want to do that. And... Do you have the wrong house or something? And I kind of made a joke out of it and nothing else happened. So I went running through the house and I went into my husband and I, he knows I have really strong intuition. He's watched it a million times happen and all sorts of things. And so I said, this just happened and I just heard this voice and I just had this feeling and this grip on the top of my head and, and I heard that I was supposed to start a scrapbook store. And my husband looked at me and said, well, I think that if you heard that big of a message that you should consider what it's going to take to create that. 
And I looked at my husband and I said, what are you talking about? I'm not going to start a scrapbook store. I'm, I work at the university. I'm staying there. I spent the entire morning that morning just talking to the other side in my head saying, you know, I don't know why you were talking to me about that. I don't get it. I got to the downtown area of Santa Barbara after lunch that day and I was driving home. Another voice in the car said, you need to stop and ask about a business loan. And it was a really business-like man's voice. And I questioned and I said, who are you people? Why are you talking to me about this? And so my bank was only one block further than that. I ended up deciding to pull into the bank and I kind of talked to the other side and said, look, if, if this is what you want me to do, I'm willing to do it, but I, I don't see the point of it. And I, I'm going to go into the bank and I'll ask about a business loan, but I really don't, I really don't know why I'm doing this. And I went into the bank and I sat before a banking officer and I told him, so I'm interested in opening up a scrapbook store. And he said, how much do you want to borrow? The absurdity of what I was doing kind of struck me as funny at that moment. And I said, I don't know, how much do you think it's going to take to start a scrapbook store? His face reflected that he thought I was just wasting his time. And I said, I, you know, I'm really sorry that I've come to talk to you. And I realize I've jumped the gun and I should probably, you know, approach the bank at a later time. And thank you so much for your time. And I just wanted to get out of there. As I was walking through the bank, the voice from the car said, now wait a minute. You can't give up that easily. You need to go back and ask someone else. And in the middle of the bank, I said to the voice in, that I could hear in my head, well, if I can hear you, then you can probably hear my thoughts. And you're not making this easy for me. You need to, to show me who it is I need to talk to. So what ended up happening was, as I was walking out the bank towards my car, this man looked at me and he raised his hand up and he waved to me and he smiled at me and I'd never seen him before. And I said, I came today to talk about a, a loan, but I realized I've jumped the gun and I actually need to figure out how to create a business plan. And the other man that I had talked to said that I needed to do a business plan. So he ended up talking to me for about 10 minutes about what a business plan was. And then he said, can you hold on for just a moment? And I, I didn't know why. And he went two cubicles down. They were glass walled cubicles. He was talking with the woman. They were looking at the computer. And when he came back about four minutes later, he said, Mrs. Bartolome, you've been approved for a $250,000 loan to start your scrapbook store. Do you and your husband want to come in tomorrow and sign paperwork for that? Well, you can imagine that that was a pretty big shock because I hadn't even wanted to really do the store. And to be just told like that, that now you, you got the money and you're going to do it, it was pretty amazing. I actually built the store in three months and it was called Santa Barbara Scrapbooks and it was in Santa Barbara, California where I live. And it ended up being a very popular place and I had it for six years before the 2008 um, crunch with the recession really took the wind out of its sails and I decided that it was important for me to move on to do something else. And um, three months after I was uh, opened the store, I was named Businesswoman of the Year for Santa Barbara. And you know that's why part of the reason why I didn't want to talk about my near-death experience because it seemed really scary to be named Businesswoman of the Year for this beautiful community and then turn around you know, a few years later and end up being, you know, told that I need to talk about my near-death experience and that I need to open an IONS group in Santa Barbara and, and have this possibility of having all of these people see me as someone different than what I had been when I was named Businesswoman of the Year. It was a big scary thing to do, but for me it was very powerful because it's the truth of what I'm saying is the total truth. I couldn't make this stuff up. It was such a life-changing event and it all unfolded in such an amazing way from that medium that spoke to me. I ended up finding the tape that she had done years later after I had started my store 
and probably two or three years into having my store, I happened to come across the tape that she had given me of that. Uh, and I thought, well, I should listen to this. And that's when I was in shock. And I said, oh my gosh, I showed it to my husband and had him listen to it. And I said, she predicted I was going to have my own business. She said that I was going to have my own business and I totally didn't believe her. And I discredited it immediately and thought that couldn't possibly be. So I really believe that if the medium has the capacity to talk to the other side, I think there could be people that, that maybe don't have that capacity that are pretending that they are mediums. And then I think there's an amazing group of people that do decide that this is going to be their life and they are going to give messages to to people and help them. I know that I get talked to from the other side, so why wouldn't anybody else that are that, that are doing that for their work be able to open up that communication from the other side and hear from either their spirit guides or God or whoever it is they think is there. Someone's there because obviously I've been hearing it too. So for me it's a, an amazing an amazing experience and I, I don't go to mediums regularly and I do have a lot of friends that are mediums now because a lot of mediums are near-death experiencers and Terry Yoder is one of them and he's a good friend now and so I, I believe that there's this opening that occurs when someone has a near-death experience that allows them to have this one foot in one side and one foot in the other side capacity of hearing from the other side and giving those messages to people. I don't want to make it a business such as what Terry has done, but for me it's given me an amazing, amazing experiences in my life. Saved my life a number of times and incredible things have happened. So I, I, I think it's wonderful. I think mediums are wonderful and if they're capable and they're, and they're hearing and they're able to give people messages, I think that's a great One thing that I also find that works in my life is the concept of optimism and thinking positively and the law of attraction where if you're thinking about something that you really want to do, then you maybe write it down and you think about it before you go to bed and you, and you see yourself in that experience like let's say that I did have the idea of, of creating a store or um, I did have the idea of traveling to Italy so what I do with my thoughts is I envision wholly that experience happening to me so if it was let's say a trip I spend time in my off hours it, let's say it's a trip to Italy looking at photographs of the different places that I would want to go and I read about it and I think strongly about being there and what I would do if I was there and so if I'm going on a trip then I visualize the pictures and I find out about the location and I believe that it'll happen and then all of a sudden something will happen where either an amount of money comes to me or my husband says, you know, for our anniversary, I, I got two tickets for Italy, you know, <laughs> and something happens. Well, that idea worked really well when I uh, went through the divorce that I had got, had to go through after my near-death experience at age 31. When I was 34, I divorced, and for two years, I envisioned the type of person that I would want in my life because the previous person had been so traumatic. And so what I would do is as I was going through my life each day in all the different contacts that I had with people, whether it be at a grocery store or at a restaurant or at my work or at friends and people that I knew, I would look for characteristics in them that I felt were positive and that I would want in someone that I would want attached to my life. And so at night before I went to sleep, after I'd put my children to bed, I would think about those characteristics and I would write them into a book. So after two years, I had 206 things written down. And I ended up meeting my current husband through my children, through my older child, met his older child. 
and they became friends and we ended up meeting and as I dated him I was able to look at that spiral bound notebook that I had written all those things into and if he if he was the person I had been listing all along and I find that after 24 years of marriage my husband is that list and he was absolutely that list and so it for me is really amazing and it tells me that anyone can do that so if you're in a bad situation let's say with a marriage or a workplace or um, anything that you've got going envisioning what you want it to be instead of what it's what it is I think there's power in that and I think that it can change the outcome of what you're looking at and I really believe our minds have that capacity and they're doing a lot of research now along the lines of that and they're finding that that's exactly what the case is is that you can actually there's a number of research um, studies that have been done where they actually were able to um, detect that the person's mind was making the change to the object that was not even present where they were at so being able to you know visualize things from afar and being able to make changes to things from afar that not not even close to where you are is actually a capacity that our minds have so I would encourage people to use that and to study about that and uh, use that in their life because for me it's been a, a big difference it really has helped I very much think there's an awakening amongst the people that have had near-death experiences and they actually are doing research now about people who haven't had a near-death experience but are exposed to the stories whether reading them or watching videos and they've actually got a research um, study that showed that those people that are hearing the stories about near-death experiences are diminishing their fear of death and the degree of grief that they feel when someone passes away because it gives them the understanding that the consciousness survives death so that is a huge benefit for the near-death experience stories to be out there in the world and I'm you know with me it's personally affected me but I'm really happy to know that giving my story when I talk to different IANS groups across the United States or I'm interviewed for YouTube videos that this is a gift I can give out to people and help other people understand that life continues past the point of death that you who you are is not the physical life that you're experiencing right now you are a spiritual being having a physical experience not a physical being having a spiritual experience and if we can get to that point where we can understand that we're all spiritual beings and that we're here to learn and grow and to love and to care for other people to be kind to make the world a better place then that's that's my message <laughs>